Messiah, deliverer, rescuer of Israel. But there's a problem that comes up. Many of Paul's fellow Jews are saying, no, he isn't. And then there's this interesting piece of many Gentiles, non-Jewish people coming in and say, oh, actually, we agree with Paul. Jesus is the Messiah, and we worship him not just as a king, but as God. And everybody's trying to say, what is going on here? How come these people who don't look like they're in, how come they're worshiping this Jesus? And how come so many people who ought to have been anticipating this, they're saying, he's not our guy. What's the story? How does this all fit? So Paul um, puts pen to scroll, and he begins to spell out for the people in his day what's happening Paul has taken another look at Scripture. He's dwelled in it carefully. He's reflected on it. And he's come to the point of recognizing uh, that what God had promised to do through Israel is indeed taking place. And it's taking place through Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah. And yet it's unfolding in a way that nobody had quite been anticipating. So Paul wants to spell that out because he knows the questions that we have about these matters are very urgent, not just in Paul's day, but in our day, because the questions always go something like this. Well, who's in then? And who's out? And on what basis are they in or out? And is any of this fair? And why does God blame us? Last week, uh, we heard the ending of the passage, and it says, Therefore, God has mercy on whom God will have mercy. And God hardens whom God wants to harden. So the obvious question is, well, if this is what God does, then why would God blame us if we find ourselves being out? That doesn't make any sense. So there's anxious questions that get asked. Who's in? Who's out? On what basis? And is any of this fair? And why does God blame us? This is what Paul is in the midst of talking about, trying to set... um, people of his day at ease a bit, trying to put his own heart at ease just a bit because this is a difficult issue for Paul. And we need to think about this. Why does God make the decisions that God makes? What's God's rationale for doing so? We want to know. So we're going to listen uh, to one piece of counsel from our own tradition that speaks to this and how we might approach this. And then we're going to spend the most of our time thinking about what Paul is actually modeling for us in the midst of this moment in his life and how that informs something of what it means for us uh, to live by faith. So here's a piece of counsel that comes to us from our own tradition from the Canons of Dort, which is uh, really an extended look in some ways at Romans 9, 10, and 11 and figure out how does God make decisions about salvation and who's in and who's out. In the midst of that, It has this counsel. It says, This teaching must be set forth with a spirit of discretion in a godly and holy manner at the appropriate time and place without inquisitive searching into the ways of the Most High. And any time we do this, it must be for the glory of God's most holy name and for the lively comfort of God's people. Now, if you're like me, you breathe a huge sigh of relief at this moment because the canons of Dort, 500 years old, I think this year, um, counsels us, don't pretend you can figure this all out. Here's what we can know for certain. God chooses. God's the first mover. God pursues. When we find ourselves in uh, Jesus Christ, we need not be afraid. We know that God is for us, not against us, that God will keep us securely, thanks be to God. Beyond that, how much can we figure out? Eh, not much, the Canons of Dort says. Trying to figure out who's in, who's out, for on which basis. It's a game that's hard to play, impossible to determine, and we're grateful for the council because we know that uh, followers of Jesus have grappled with these questions, and all too often the result has been they walk away from each other and they form their own Denominations. I heard a speaker talking earlier this week. He was talking about, hang on, competing, particular, universalisms. Okay. He's talking about the fact that there are faith traditions in the world that are making exclusive claims about which faith is right, about which claims are right. And they come into contact with each other in the midst of lived life, and they butt heads. That's true. That happens. We see that happening. 
Here's what the Canons of Dort recognizes. Within the community of followers of Jesus, interpretations, claims, they come into conflict with each other. And the temptation is to resolve it all nice and tidily, and, and it just doesn't quite happen that way. So new denominations form. And then we try to figure out, well, who's right and who's wrong? And I'm not exactly sure that's where God would want us as his people. We try to have to understand scripture and live with its mystery and say, we have faith in Jesus Christ. God is at work. God pursues. God calls. And we're going to live with a bit of mystery there. There's counsel here that's helpful for the Christian church in general because it reminds us that we're, we're coming before God whose ways are not our ways, whose wisdom is beyond our understanding, and yet we can be confident that as we live by faith in Jesus Christ, we're right where we need to be. Okay, that's the counsel. Here's what Paul is demonstrating for us, what he's really modeling that becomes really helpful for us as we live by faith as followers of Jesus Christ in this world, and it comes down to this. In a sense, Paul is modeling for us the fact that to live by faith is to give God the benefit of the doubt. When I was in college, I was hanging out with my older brother and one of his friends, and something came up for discussion. It involved a particular person. I don't remember the person. I don't remember the situation. I just remember that there were different interpretations of this person and what was happening, and was this person right, wrong? How should this person be viewed? I don't remember any details. I remember my brother's friend saying, I'm just going to give him the benefit of the doubt. And I'm still struck by that. This, the graciousness to say, I don't have all the details. I don't know enough at this point. So in the meantime, I'm going to give this person the benefit of the doubt. If you're like me, uh, you're maybe not the quickest to come to that point. Um, sometimes I go for the, the quick oil change. I want a 10-minute deal. I want to be in and out, and I roll down my window, and then uh, the questions begin, and, and eventually, like, I think you should have your transmission fluid flushed and changed. And I'm like, I wasn't even thinking about my transmission fluid, and I'm not sure you have my best interests in mind, and it's going to cost me $149 to do this? I, I don't want to give this person the benefit of the doubt. They know way more about vehicles than I do. They can look at the color of this fluid and diagnose it, and I'm still not sure I'm going to trust this person because $149. And then we think of God. And when it comes to who's in and who's out, can we give God the benefit of the doubt on this? This is a painful issue. Can we give God the benefit of the doubt? So Paul says, God has mercy on whom he's going to have mercy. And God hardens whom he's going to harden. And our first question is, well, then why does God blame us? If God is going to have mercy, if God is going to do the hardening, how am I culpable in any of this? And Paul comes back with a, another question. Well, well, who are you to question God? Who are you, a lump of clay, to talk back to the potter? And it sounds at first, maybe, as though Paul is laying down the ultimate trump card and we have no voice left in the matter and our, our questions and our, our, our yearnings and our pain doesn't have any place. And then we remember how this conversation began. And it began with Paul saying that he lives with constant anguish and sorrow. This is not an academic exercise for Paul. This is a very personal, painful moment in his life where he's looking at so many of his fellow Israelites who have not acknowledged Jesus as the Messiah has, Paul has, and it fills him with anguish and sorrow. And yet, he's demonstrating that despite his discomfort with this, despite the fact that he says he would, he would be cut off for the sake of his fellow Israelites, if it meant that they would be gathered in. Despite all of this for Paul, he's posturing himself in such a way where his only stance now is to say, but I'm going to give God the benefit of the doubt on this. It's deeply painful for me. But this is what we read in Scripture, and this is what God is doing, and I'm going to let God figure this out. This topic 
Romans 9, 10, 11, election, predestination, who's in, who's out. Comes up in seminary, and I remember one of my profs grappling with this. He didn't like it any more than any of us like it in terms of trying to understand all of this and the questions that arise. And he said at the end of this discussion, after all the questions are being asked and debated and discussed, and he says, I simply trust that in the end, God, the just judge, will do right. And he rested in that. I simply trust that in the end, God, the just judge, will do right. This is what Paul is modeling for us. This is painful for him. The questions that he's asking, most likely, are as much his own as they are the people that he's imagining. And he's basically saying that I trust that in the end, God, the just judge, will do right. The reason that Paul can be so confident in this, why the sovereign one who appears to have mercy on some and heart in others, the reason that Paul can be so confident in the fact that God will do right is because of what he's recognized about God in the act of God through Jesus Christ. I mean, who's going to come to earth and endure crucifixion not as the outcome of bad happenstance, but as an act of obedience, as an act of self-choosing. This is at the heart of the hymn that Paul writes in Philippians 2. We know it. This Jesus, who in very nature is God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, not to be held onto, but but he emptied himself. He, He took the very nature of a servant. And he became obedient to death. Even even death on a cross, not for his sake, but for, for our sake. It's this recognition of the nature of God, the sheer determination of God to, to spare the people he's created from misery by having mercy on them. That's enough for Paul to give God the benefit of the doubt to say, even though what's happening is painful for me, even though I don't understand fully what is happening and how God is going to work this all out, I trust that God, who is a just judge, will do right because I see what God is like in emptying himself out, even to the point of death on the cross, so that we might have life. This is what leads Paul to say earlier in Romans 8, well, if God is for us, well, then who can be against us? God who did not spare his own son, but but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? In the moment it's painful, in the moment I can't see fully what's happening and how it's all going to resolve, but I'm going to trust that God, the just judge, will do right. These are painful circumstances for us sometimes when we think about how this topic about who's in who's out who's saved who's maybe not demonstrating faith it becomes personal for us some of you have shared this with me over the years there's there's somebody in your family who isn't exhibiting the kind of faith that you would like to see Uh, they grew up with it they know it and in some ways it feels like they've walked away from it and you're longing for them to express more evidence of faith in Jesus Christ. You just long to see it, and yet in the midst of it, you say things like, but I know that God has made promises to my loved one. And I know that God is faithful to those promises. And I know that God is pursuing my loved one. And so I trust that in the midst of this, now and in the future, that God will do right. That's a tough posture to maintain when it becomes that personal and it feels that painful, and yet it's the posture that you maintain. I I trust that God is going to do right now and in the future. Because I know that God is merciful. And I know that God is for us and not against us. And I see the very nature of God on display through the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And if that is what God is like, then I trust, well, I can trust God. 
Because it assures me that, well, one, I have to remember God is God. And the crucifixion reminds us that God is good. And because God is good, well, then, well, then we can give God the benefit of the doubt. Sometimes maybe we find that we need to do this with other circumstances. Maybe it's not our own personal faith. Maybe it's not the faith of a loved one. Maybe it gets down to those questions that we asked last week. Well, why this disease? Yeah. We don't always know about that. Why the death of this loved one now? I, I, don't, I don't fully understand that. Why, why does God seem silent now? And, and I cry out, and it doesn't seem as though God is hearing and answering. Why is that? Why is it that um, my lived out faith in Jesus Christ seems to be translated into circumstances that get harder and more challenging and not easier. Why is that? And then, and then why does God allow some of his people to suffer as he does? Why? And maybe we're simply invited uh, to take the same posture as Paul, who in the midst of a painful set of personal circumstances immersed himself in scripture yet again, and through the process of that immersion and that reflection, came to the posture of being able to say, I trust that God, who is good, will do right. And so I'm going to give God the benefit of the doubt. If we look back briefly over scripture, this is where we find Job at the end of Job. If you go to the end of Habakkuk or Habakkuk, that's where you find that guy. If you go to the Garden of Gethsemane, that's where you find Jesus. Would you take the cup from me? Yet not my will, but yours be done. Because I'm going to trust that somehow in the midst of this and in the end, you, O oh God, will do right. And Jesus' faith was vindicated in the resurrection. That's where we live. We long to make sense of the data. We wish we could extrapolate meaning from the results, from the circumstances of our lives, so that we can know with certainty what's happening, what it means, and how we are to live. Most of the time, we can only offer our best guess and then entrust the rest of it to God and give God the benefit of the doubt. And we find it such a wise posture to take because God is God and because God is good and because we're confident that in the end, this just judge of all the world, well, he will do right. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, uh, we're, we're, we're looking at Paul, and this section of Romans comes out of such a deep personal place for him, where he's struggling with the realities that he's seeing, and yet he... He ends this section with such a burst of praise, which is so instructive for us because it reminds us that even when we can't see clearly, even when we can't figure it out, even when we would long for things to be different, you are worthy of our trust and you are worthy of our praise. Father, we pray that you would strengthen our faith where we need it to be strengthened that you would embolden us to trust where we find it difficult to trust, where we find ourselves facing circumstances that we'd rather not face, and we're not sure if we should give you the benefit of the doubt in the midst of it, we pray that you would compel us again by your acted out self-testimony in Jesus Christ, that you are for us and not against us, and you will see to it either now or in the future that you will work things out for our good. We acknowledge this isn't the easiest posture for us to take and to live with in life. So strengthen us by your spirit. Continue to draw us to your face in Jesus Christ and help us to remember that it's his resurrection that reminds us that no matter what it is that we face, no matter how you and your purposes are opposed in this world, you have the final say. And we pray this in Jesus' name.
Amen.